I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for updates on podcast guests and lots of live events. So I just got this really cool new pair of leggings from blissbodyshop.com. And I just wanted to tell you all about it because they're super cool. And um, they ended up giving me a little code so you all can try them for 15% off. So it's blissbodyshop.com, B-L-I-S-S, blissbodyshop.com. And if you enter Zibby Owens 15, Z-I-B-B-Y-O-T, W-E-N-S-15, you will get 15% off of these leggings. And I wear leggings all the time on the weekends uh, with my big oversized vest and some sort of comfy sweatshirt or something to run around and chase my kids. And I travel in them a lot. And um, I mean, who doesn't need leggings? And I should mention that I work out in them, but I do that far less than all the other things I do. Anyway, go check it out, blissbodyshop.com, and use the code ZibbyOwens15 and get yourself some leggings. Stephanie Robel is the author of debut novel Darling Rose Gold. Stephanie has an MFA from Emerson College and has had short fiction published in Bellevue Literary Review. Before turning to fiction, she worked as a creative copywriter at several advertising agencies. She grew up in Chicago and currently lives in the UK with her husband and their dog, Moose Barkwinkle. So welcome, Stephanie. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to discuss Darling Rose Gold. Are you very excited for it to come out? Yes, it's been such a whirlwind process, and it's crazy that it's like here now. Oh my gosh. Wait, so first of all, tell everybody what Darling Rose Gold is about and how you came up with the idea for this novel. Sure. So the book is about a mother and daughter named Patty and Rose Gold Watts. And Rose Gold is sick for the first 18 years of her life. She has a feeding tube. She uses a wheelchair to get around. She has her hair falling out in clumps. And no one can figure out what's wrong with her until it comes out that Patty was actually making everything up all along. And so Patty goes to jail for five years, and the book starts with her getting out of prison. And so she gets out and, of course, has no one to turn to. Everyone has deserted her. So she begs her now adult daughter, Rose Gold, to take her in. And to the shock of everyone in town, Rose Gold says yes. And so mother and daughter move in together, and Patty insists all she wants is to reconcile. She's forgiven her daughter for testifying against her. But Rose Gold knows her mother, and she knows that Patty always settles a score. But the question is, how has Rose Gold changed over the five years while Patty's been in prison? Because she's definitely not the weakling that her mother thinks that she is. So it's a story about obsession and reconciliation and revenge. Ooh, that's a good description. Thanks. I've practiced plus, it a few yeah, times. So, you know what? That was a, that was a great one. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. you. Just bottle that one up. <laughs> it's so funny because as I was reading, every time Rose Gold would like let her mother in a little more, I was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you can stay. Was, no. Okay. You can watch the baby. No. <laughs> I feel like I, I wanted to like scream at her, but <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a sort of sense of foreboding because you're not quite sure what she's mm-hmm. capable of. But yeah, yeah, obviously, don't really trust her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what inspired you to write this book? How did you come up with the plot? What made you? What this is your first novel? Why, yeah, why this? So, I first found out about Munchausen by proxy, which is what Patty has from my best friend, who's an elementary school psychologist in Colorado, and she unfortunately has experience with the syndrome through the, her work with her students and their parents. So she told me about it, and I was immediately like riveted and horrified, and I went down this rabbit hole of research, and I was really surprised to find that the perpetrators are typically women and often mothers. And, you know, like we think of this mother-child bond as sacred, but it's not in these cases, and I wanted to explore why that was. So it was really, even though Rose Gold is the titular character, it was really Patty who I was interested in getting in her mindset, figuring out. Does she know that she's lying? Does she honestly believe she's doing what's best for her kids? So it was just kind of the why behind these people's behavior. And did you learn in your research what compels people to act this way? Yeah, so it's a desire for love and attention from the medical community, so from doctors and nurses. I think that's the most intriguing part is it's not as simple as, you know, there are different cases which are called malingering where, you know, you're trying to maybe defraud the hospital or you want like a free make-a-wish trip or whatever. And I think... Those motivations are are awful as well, but they're almost more understandable because I guess greed is just a more common, I guess, concept in society. But I think just this this notion of needing attention and love from sources because you didn't have it yourself as a child because the perpetrators of MSPB are usually or usually severely abused or neglected themselves as kids. 
So it's so sad. I know. I know. I mean, Sorry, really, this is no, no. Not, I mean, not a light conversation, but yeah, it is really. I mean, it's interesting to think about. I'm always fascinated with the nature versus nurture conversation. You know, there's plenty of people who have horrible childhoods that don't grow up to do this kind of stuff. So I'm really interested in why do some people totally, you know, yeah, and then to explore and see it in real, you know, real life, not really real life, but to see the, the effects of that on a child and. Yeah. What happens and right. And how much of a I mean, what hope do they have for their own normal life after that? Yeah. So when you started when did you start writing this book and how long did it take? Where did you like to write it? Yeah. Home, you know. All the process. All, stuff. all the process stuff. Um so I wrote This is my process yeah. question. Yeah. Go ahead. So I wrote the first draft the summer of twenty seventeen and I was in an M- MFA program at the time at Emerson College in Boston. And I ended up getting like tossing that entire first draft, except for these two characters. I had a professor who was really nice and offered to read the first hundred pages. And he was like, this kind of is just reading as a case study of Munchausen. It doesn't really have its own thing. And he was right. He was completely right. And I, he saved me a lot of time by <laughs> offering to do that. So then I spent most of 2018 writing what's this, you know, this final version. And I actually wrote this as my thesis for my MFA program. And I was really lucky to work with a different professor who really took me under her wing. She worked with me all summer, like even during her summer break, which was really nice of her. And then I submitted it as my thesis in November of 2018. And then a few professors suggested that I submit it to agents. So I did. And now here we are. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So what was that process like from going from student to success with the book? And wasn't there some auction? Like there was a lot of hubbub around the... Yeah. Sale of it, right? Wasn't there some? Um, Yes. In the UK, it went to auction, which was crazy and amazing and exhilarating. But yeah, after, so I signed with my agent in December and then we went over some, we'd made some kind of small like plot hole type changes. And then she took it out end of February. And it was basically like, I think 10 days later. I mean, she's amazing at her job. So I think 10 days later, like I, all on the same day, it was like the UK, US and Canada deals all like came through. It was the best day of my life. I bet. (laughs) Yeah, it was amazing. Hold on to that one. I can still remember like standing at my table and being like, oh my God, this is happening. So it's so exciting. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. That's really awesome. Thank you. It's just so nice to see when hard work pays off like this. Yeah. I mean, I definitely was expecting this whole process. You know, you hear like it takes a really long time to get an agent. So I was like really in for the long haul. And so it was just such a relief and so surprising that it worked out the way that it did. And are you working on anything else now? Yes. So I'm working on my second book and I've been describing it as a wellness center with some cult-like tendencies. Mm. So it's from three points of view, a leader, a member, and a concerned relative. Interesting. Yeah. And is it still like you don't know what's going to happen necessarily? Like, is there intrigue? Yeah. It's like thrillers, suspense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I like that. I really like that kind of propulsive nature of Mm -hmm. the genre. You know, just this idea of like, you can't, you think like, okay, I'll just get to the end of this chapter as a reader. And then it's like, it's like, that's always when the best thing happens. You know, I I really like that kind of structure. I love that word propulsive. I feel like anytime (laughs) anything is described as propulsive, I'm like, ooh. Yeah, (laughs) give me more. (laughs) I shouldn't say that because now everything will be described as propulsive. (laughs) I felt like you did such a good job, not just with the characters, but with developing a sense of place. Like I really felt like the town that you were describing and Mm. how it had been a place where kids used to play on the sidewalks and like much more of a happy village that had sort of gone to disarray, especially while she was gone and how she goes back and inhabits this old family home of hers and the house across the street is like abandoned. And like, Mm. you just get the sense, even the supermarket and having a how she has to go two towns over and the small town of it. Like, Describe how you picked this particular village and the setting for this story. Sure. So it's completely fictitious. It's not based on anywhere. But I I knew I wanted it to be kind of in central southern Illinois, which, I mean, I haven't spent much time there. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, which are very populated. But I wanted it to be a really small town and have this very insular feel so that you know, Patty, it's not as simple for her to get out, go back to her hometown and just kind of blend or find new people. You know, if it's a big enough town, you can, maybe not everybody would know your story, but here, like, everybody knows her business. And so it really puts her in the spotlight, which normally she likes, but this isn't a, she's not used to being, you know, just completely hated. And I think one book that I was really, like, kind of inspired me as far as, like, 
making the townspeople a character on their own was um, We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson, which is, you know, this like very gothic thriller. And But the townspeople there are just this, they're just so eerie. You know, they're, they're a looming presence and you can feel them. They're sort of suffocating. And I was hoping to get some sort of semblance of that in this book. Did your own relationship with your family play into this at all? I'm sure no. not. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. I was, I have started to be like, people have started to ask that occasionally. And I'm like, you can imagine how much my mom enjoys that question. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm sure not, but I just, yeah. you know, you no, like to know curious. what your own relationship, like, are you close yeah. with your family? I'm or? very close with my family. My parents are super supportive. So I think I wrote in the acknowledgements, like creating Patty as this monster was a bit more difficult because I didn't have any of that sort of experience to draw. On, but no, it's like we're we're very close, and they've been so excited and supportive through this whole process, which is really lovely. And tell me about how you've you live in the UK now, and you've moved mm-hmm. for your husband back and forth. Like, tell me about that's how you've ended up there in, in your life, and what you think about that, and if it's affected your writing at all. Sure. So we moved to London in 2014, so that my husband could go to London Business School, and we thought it was just going to be a two year thing. But then we both really loved it there, but. After his program was finished, then I went to graduate school in Boston. So then we moved to Boston in 2016, lived there for the duration of the program, and he was working remotely for a UK company that whole time. And so then we were looking for an excuse to get back to London. And so he took on a different role at his company, so that you know required us to be there. And yeah, we've been living there again since May 2018. So it's been close to four years total. And it really feels like home now. You know, we have our set of friends. We know all the neighborhoods. We just, like, know how everything works now. So, but yeah, how has it influenced my writing? I guess you start to empathize more with people who have been outsiders, I think. Mm. You know what? Certainly the first time that we moved, I really had a hard time finding my footing. You know, when he went to business school, it was immediately like 400 best friends to choose from. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've discovered, I worked in advertising before this, and the industry is really competitive in London. So it was very difficult to, like, I couldn't get a salaried position the whole time I was there. I was working freelance. And so that was really tough. And I just kind of felt like this was the first time in my life that I was really flailing. And it actually worked out well because this is, that is what led me to apply to grad school because I didn't feel like I had as much to lose. Whereas if I was working, you know, a good job, I don't know if I would have been gutsy enough to kind of just quit my job to, on a whim, try to write a book. But definitely at the time, it was, there were, there were feelings of isolation. And I think also I didn't want to tell people back home in the U.S. that I was, you know, lonely or struggling because, to them, it's like, oh, what an adventure. And you don't want to seem ungrateful. And, you know, it is, of course, there were many positives and a lot of really cool stuff. You know, it's in two hours, you're in Spain or Italy or any number of countries. But there were, it was certainly not without its challenges. But that's like the whole woe is me problem, mm-hmm. right? Like, because things seem good on the outside, you're not yeah. supposed to feel the emotions that you feel, which yeah. are completely discounted, which I disagree with. I mean, <laughs> you never, I mean, it's hard when you go somewhere you don't have friends yet. I mean, it's always yeah. hard. Yeah. Especially, I mean, I went to business school and a lot of my closest friends were partners of people in my class of business school. Yes. Like the wives or the girlfriends of the guys in my class it became like some of my best friends who were still some of my best friends. But they always felt kind of marginalized a little bit. Yeah. Because so much of the social life is centered for the students. And yes, they yes. include the partners sometimes, but not all the times. And yeah. I don't know, and sort of like second class like, citizen. Right? Yeah, you're introduced like as someone's partner, which right. was a new thing for me. You know, I wasn't used to being like, this is Matt's partner, Stephanie. I was like, right. well, I'm really just like Stephanie. Stephanie on my own. But, yeah. And I think I got yeah. to, go ahead. No, no, I was just, some of the partners had like the coolest mm. careers and jobs and backgrounds yeah. ever. But at business school, they're just somebody else's partner. Yeah. And I think I got too hung up initially with being like, no, I want my own friends. You know, like I, mm-hmm. I don't want to make friends through his business school. I want them to be my own friends, which is funny because now, you know, four years later, there's still some of my best friends as people that we met through LBS. But, you know, you have your pride and you're, you want to do things your way and then you... Live and you'll learn. Yeah. But how great that all of it that yeah. comes out in fiction <laughs> yeah, and I mean, uh, delights the, other people. And- yeah. At the time, it definitely felt like a low point. But honestly, I really don't know. Like, if I were still, I, I was in Chicago before that. That's where I'm from. I don't know that I would have, yeah, had the guts to just up and quit my job or tried to balance writing a novel at the same time while working a demanding advertising job. So, I mean, I'm trying to think if there are people who haven't gone through some sort of pain, who have written books. I mean, Mm. I feel like 
there's always something that people are writing about or that they've noticed or that they've felt that other people can relate to. And yeah. it's not like, I don't know. I just feel like it's rare to have a person say, everything in my life has gone totally yeah. perfectly well. And I decided I'm just going to write a novel for fun. Too. Yeah. Like usually there's something they're trying to work through or I don't yeah. know, I'm massively generalizing. So I apologize if I'm offending authors by saying that. But I just feel like there's usually something people are wrestling with or interested in or something. Yeah, and I think that's why it's good. As much as sometimes I'm like, oh, why didn't I try this earlier? Like, why didn't I take this seriously younger? But I do think, like, you need to have a little life experience under your belt and have gone through, like, some hardships, some relationship stuff, you know what I mean? I think— But you are young. Well, I mean, I'm not 22. No, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm in my 30s. Yeah, so, I know. Yeah, I mean, For, to me, that's young. I'm in my 30s. So, I guess, yes, but to me, I feel like you're young. Yeah. I'm just always impressed when I see very young people because to have that sort of like grip on humanity and just, you know what I mean? Like the sort of general truths of being a person. I think, I mean, at least I didn't have that when I was in my early 20s. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So, yeah. I feel like that's why so many people in their 20s end up writing YA or some, mm. you know, because that, that's what they know well. And that's yeah. great. Like, write about that. You should write. But it's harder to write about. It's really important, like, too, know? because I feel like for me, at least, I, I can't even remember what it was like at this point to be a teenager. I mean, in a very general way, or if I were to read YA, I'd be mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. But I just like feel like I don't have access to that time anymore of my life. So it's it's great to have people who totally do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Sure. So I have three things. I've thought about this because I've listened to your podcast. Oh, I, knew this, I knew this was knew a this question was that you asked. I'm sorry, am I getting formulated? No, it's great. I feel like this is the question that people always want to know. So, So my first one is to set some sort of writing goal, whether it's number of words or an amount of time per day, per week, per month, because I feel like if you can feel yourself just chipping away at a chapter each time, it's less overwhelming than just thinking, I need to write 90,000 words. My second one is to get qualified feedback. So I think as much as we need to have our butts in chairs practicing, if you're not getting feedback from somebody who, whether it's a professor, but it doesn't have to be an MFA program, it could just be a workshop or whatever you can manage, I think it's really important to get that feedback because that's how you improve. I mean, I know for me, having this professor just constantly giving me feedback, I improved so much faster than I would have on my own. And the third thing is to treat the business side of publishing as part of the job because it is part of the job. You have to treat it like a small business because it is. And so for me, that meant studying query letters and looking up resources and figuring out how this process worked alongside writing the book. I really don't recommend waiting until you are ready to send the query out to start writing the query. I just kind of treated it as another writing project. And so I went through draft after draft after draft. And then by the time I was actually ready to do it, I had I felt good about it. So those are my thoughts. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having them so ready. This is perfect. You just yeah. like everything is turned up on a flatter today. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on and thanks for writing this fantastic book and good luck with the launch and everything else. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. You've been listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zibby Owens. Please make sure to sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com to get more updates about episodes like these and also lots of live events. Just a reminder, go to Bliss Body Shop and enter code ZibbyOwens15 and get yourself a new pair of leggings for 15% off. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. Mm-hmm.